Before we get started, I'm happy to say this video was sponsored by JLC PCB. They've recently expanded into machining and 3D printing and provided the slotted disc for the spindle, the 3D printed control panels, and most recent round of PCBs. There have been a few rounds of PCBs. Well, there goes my special effects budget. I'll go over each item in more detail as we go. Before we start looking closer at how this all works, let's get our bearings. As with all things in life, our goal here is to obtain shiny things. In a lathe, the spindle turns the workpiece and an axis feeds a cutting tool into it. If we maintain that turn to feed ratio, we maximize our chances of obtaining a shiny part. It turns out a human wrist can only do so many revolutions before it turns out. So I opted to use an electric motor. If we're going to make a powered axis that can synchronize with a spindle, we're going to need some kind of a brain. In this case, a Teensy 4.0. If we want to move the axis, we'll also need an electric motor. Also a small encoder on the motor to make sure it's doing what it says it's doing. Speaking of encoders, for the spindle we're going to use photo interrupters and a slotted disc. In this case we need three. One's required to measure speed, a second was required to tell you what direction it's moving, and I'm going to use a third one as a threading reference. Being a millennial, I'm also going to need a screen to look at, but it's also needed to keep track of how much we're feeding per revolution. Speaking of feeding, we'll need a switch to tell it when to feed and in what direction, and we'll need some kind of a knob to select how much feed per revolution. I've also decided to add some slide switches to keep track of units and settings, and to avoid having to learn how to save things in memory. Oh, also the motor we're using is going to need a stepper driver because it is a stepper motor. As tempting as it is to breadboard this out and cram it all into a box, certain parts of the electrical system have to be close to certain parts of the machine. I put all of the user interface stuff together in a control panel of sorts, and that'll probably live somewhere on the carriage. The Teensy will be inside the headstock, since I want it to be close to some of the sensors and controls on the front of the machine. The motor should obviously be on the axis it's feeding, and the photo interrupters need to be near the spindle. This gives me a rough idea of what different boards I'll need. Okay, now it's time to connect everything. Now, this looks worse than it is. We're going to use printed circuit boards for the individual outlined sections here. Printed circuit boards, or PCBs, for the purpose of this video, are made by magic, cost almost nothing, can accommodate more complexity than I can imagine, and are absolutely worth learning how to make. I've been using JLC PCB for a few years now to make PCBs. Their sponsorship for this video is more centered around their new 3D printing and machining services. However, I've been happy with their PCB service and wanted to recommend it. They have a browser-based tool called EasyEDA that's easy to learn and lets you design and order PCBs in the same place. The boards ship quickly and are shockingly inexpensive. I've been considering shingling my house in them. The only time I use soldered proto boards now is for the sweet, nostalgic smell of failure and solder fumes. You'd swear that the connectivity on the PCB is the most tedious part, but as long as your schematic is correct, Easy EDA makes sure you don't miss any connections. What worried me from the beginning was the connections between the boards. I wasn't worried enough. The first two interboard connections aren't that bad. The motor and encoder happen to require 9 wires, meaning I can use a DB9 cable, which is the right combination of reliable and cheap. This means that the very noisy motor coil current will be flowing past the much daintier encoder signals, and that is bad practice. However, I've never had a problem with this arrangement provided the cable is short. The three photo interrupts have three signal conductors, but will actually have five wires. They need a power and a ground, but they can share it between them. The photo interrupts will actually be inside the headstock within about a foot of the teensy, so I'm okay with just using twisted wires to connect them. Let's zoom in a bit on the connection between the control panel and the board that has the teensy on it. A control panel necessarily has a lot of user inputs and outputs, and we have to communicate all that to the Teensy, so we have a lot of signals going back and forth. In this case, we have two signals going to the screen, three from the knob, four from the toggle switches, and two from the feed switch. I also want the option to add an LED as a non-screen spamming indicator. We'll also need 3.3 volt power, we won't need 5 volt power, but I sure seem to think we did, and we'll need a ground. Altogether, this amounts to 14 wires, which I'm horrified to say is more than 9, so I can't use my precious DB9 connector. It would have been so much easier if there had been some kind of high-density 15-pin D connector with the same form factor that was also extremely common and inexpensive, but modern technology has only come so far. If we look at the signals up close, we can see that the screen communicates using the I2C bus. I2C is a communication protocol that the Teensy can use to talk to ICs and other modules. It's a bit like a Zoom call. It would be chaotic if everyone tried to talk at once, but when the boss is going around asking individuals for updates, only one person is talking and the boss can get the information he needs. Everybody else can freeze their screens and go get a snack. 
Because only two wires are needed for I2C, and I2C can communicate with a lot of different devices, I searched for ways of using I2C to cut down on the number of signal wires I had between the TNC board and the control panel. And that's when I saw it, a PCF8574. She had 16 silvery legs, a boxy black dress. She could handle eight IO signals and wasn't afraid to interrupt. Not only was she fluent in Arduino, she had a library on the subject. I'm gonna stop now. As I creepily alluded to, the PCF8574 is an integrated circuit that allows you to use input-output over the I2C bus. The microcontroller just has to ask it, Hey PCF8574, what's your pin 2 doing right now? And it'll reply, Oh, it's low, someone's pushing the feed switch. With this new IC, let's revisit the interface between the two boards. People with any knowledge of board-to-board -board communication are probably screaming at their screens right now. I'm about to double down on I2C and it's going to cause me headaches. But look how nice it looks. You can see I've dramatically reduced the number of wires that have to go back and forth between the boards. I've done this mostly for time-insensitive things. The encoder knob, for example, uses interrupts on the TNC, so I wanted to keep those a direct connection. This probably wasn't necessary, as I'm slowly learning everything in the physical world is so much slower than things in the electronic world that what I think is time-sensitive really probably isn't. Now that we think we have the connection between the two boards figured out, which, spoiler alert, we don't, we can have a little closer look at each board. This is the current revision of the display board. It looks different, but the components are all there. The four selection switches are up the right side, the screen is on the top left, the encoder is on the bottom left, and there's a space for the feed switch on the bottom right. It's a cutout to keep it on the same plane as the front of the panel. Turning the board around, we can see the remainder of the components. The PCF8574 and two connectors. I use JST-XH connectors on the back of the board with the intention of using a small cable assembly to convert it to DB9. My reasoning was it gives me more mounting options with the DB9 in the physical enclosure. There's an additional integrated circuit that I didn't need. It converted a signal that used the 5 volt, which I also didn't need, back to 3.3 volts. Please disregard. The last thing you'll see around are these passive components. I'm not going to go into great detail about what the passive components actually do in this video, but I may make a short appendix video that covers some of what I've learned in this project. How these passive components are used will definitely be part of that. Now we can turn our focus to the control board, the one with the TNC on it. I'm showing you the actual board rather than the rendering because there are no embarrassing rework wires all over it. You can sometimes fix routing mistakes, but it will cost you your dignity. The main feature on this board is the TNC. The TNC has to connect to lots of different modules, so this board mostly just routes the signals to connectors that will physically be connected to those modules. This board is also powered by 24 volts DC. It supplies that directly to the stepper motor driver and converts it down to 5 volts for the TNC and 3.3 volts for some of the peripherals. I learned some really great things about protection circuits while designing this and I'm hoping to share that in a future video. You'll also notice an onboard TMC2209 stepper motor driver. For this application, as well as for something like a powered quill feed, a small NEMA 17 size stepper motor should be plenty, so I decided to add sockets for a stepper motor driver just to make things convenient. The step, direction, and enable signals are also available in a connector for a larger external driver. A larger stepper motor might be desirable for something like a powered synchronized rotary axis. The back of the board has most of the passive components on it as well as an array of level shifters. Most consumer grade quasi-industrial sensors that I use seem to like 5 volts and the TNC operates on 3.3 volt logic. May revision one of this board rest in peace. You can also see some of the protection components like fuses and diodes that prevent accidental shorts from doing too much damage. May revision two of this board rest in peace. The control PCB with the TNC was always just going to go inside some kind of dustproof enclosure in the headstock of the machine, but the control panel needed a little more thought. I'd planned all along to use SLA printing for the front panel because I knew it would be able to capture the detail I was looking for. It wouldn't be perfect, but I thought it was all I had access to. Then JLC PCB approached me to showcase their machining and 3D printing, so I jumped at the opportunity to make the front plate out of metal. This is 3D printed in stainless steel and costs about $40. JLC PCB actually gave me some coupons to give out for $54 from new users, which would cover this control panel comfortably. I don't know how many coupons they've allocated or how long the offer is active for, so I'd recommend jumping on them fairly quickly. The links are in the description of this video. Ordering the 3D printed parts from JLC PCB was actually pretty easy. I just had to drag the solid files into their website, select the options I wanted, and I hit order. The parts arrived about two weeks after ordering. I was going to do an unboxing, but I was way, way too excited to see how they turned out. I designed the faceplates to have a half millimeter relieved area. I was going for the old machine faceplate look, paint in the low spots and shiny metal on the high spots. Uh -huh. If I were to do this again, I probably would have gone for a one millimeter deep relief in the background, and I might have made the font a little bit bolder. 
The 3D printing was able to capture all the detail and had sort of a fine cast finish, but I wish I had more material to cut away from the front face to make it shiny. As I said at the beginning, it's all about shiny things. Here's a pro tip, if you're not good at designing PCBs, they make really good paint scrapers. So it turns out that 3D printed stainless steel cuts a lot like 304 stainless. It's a little gummy and it likes to smear. All in all though I ended up with the surface finish I'm happy with. As I said earlier, if I could do it all over again, I would have had a bit more relief on the painted surface to give me some more space to fine tune things. The PCB installs into the back of the faceplate. A square cutout and anti-rotation pegs in the printed faceplate allow the switch to be configured both vertically and horizontally. I'm planning on using the same system on multiple machines, and the vertical orientation will suit powered quill feeds. The rotary encoder and switch have nuts that hold them tightly to the faceplate. An SLA printed rear panel with standoffs assembles into the rear of the faceplate and makes a front plate PCB standoff rear plate sandwich. M2 flathead screws are screwed through the front panel to hold the whole assembly together. The rear panel has a male DB9 connector and an 8mm mounting lug. Remember to only use male pin connectors on assemblies that do not supply power. The goal is to use female sockets for powered connections to prevent them from accidentally touching things. So now we have an assembled control panel. I'm sure you're thinking to yourself, is Greg finally going to succeed with an electronics project? Well do I have news for you. It turns out that if you dig really deep into the I2C protocol, you will discover that I2C stands for Inter-Integrated Circuit, as in on the same board. It's designed for short distances and not made to go from board to board. This has been causing me problems when the PCBs are separated. They occasionally work, but it's not reliable. Certain TNC boards will only work with certain control panels. The DB9 cable has to be short, and sometimes if you leave the boards connected long enough, the screen will freeze. I'll need to revise the PCB one more time to fix the issue, but for now I've drilled some holes in a piece of acrylic to hold the TNC and control panels close together. With that caveat aside, now we can answer the biggest question of all. Greg, does your electronics project work? Yes it does. I want to apologize ahead of time for the frame sync issues. It's just a matter of the frame rate of the camera with the refresh rate of the screen. It looks like there's rolling black bars on it when in fact there aren't. So first thing you do is power it up. For now, it's just a matter of plugging it in. Okay, so, so once we've got it powered on, the first thing we'll do is units. So this happens to be backwards based on the labels. I can just fix that quickly. Didn't notice it till now. Um, so inch and metric is displayed up in the top left corner here. Uh, then there's feeding and threading. So if we're in metric, feeding and threading doesn't really do much because um, millimeters per thread and millimeters per rev are going to be the same thing. So it's just a different order of magnitude. If we're in inch mode, then of course it does the threads per inch, which is useful. Um, to do any of this, we have to be synchronized with the spindle. So I don't have spindle synchronicity quite yet. I don't have the sensors installed. So I can't really show that. Um, but I have a, a button here, or a switch here, sorry, that does sync versus unsync. So synchronized will basically require input from the spindle and it will move um, a feed per rev. So it'll feed a certain distance every time the spindle revolves. Just in case you don't have access to that or you know, you don't get around to installing it right away either. I've also got um, an unsynchronized mode. So that is gonna be like inches per second, millimeters per second. Um, threading, just not gonna work. You need to have synchronicity for threading. Um, I'm gonna disable that option so you can't select it. So this direction one is just gonna be what direction you feed in versus what direction you wrap it in. I made it so one way on the switch will do feeding and then the other way will do rapiding. The idea is you feed in a bit on your cross slide and then you can feed forward with your compound slide. You feed out on your cross slide and then you can wrap it back. Um, there are some situations where you want to be turning towards the tailstock. So for that situation, I've got it so you can basically flip the direction that the rapid is. Um, the knob is a button as well as a knob. So you press the button to to go into a mode where you can select the feed per rev or the feed per second. Uh, and then you press it again to save it, so to speak. For now, there isn't really a huge purpose for having a push to select turn, push to deselect. But in the future, if I want to add features, 
it'll be nice to have the knob that I can use that for. And then finally, the little joystick. It's a momentary, so when you let it go, it stops. Um, so it feeds one way, and then rapids back. The rapid isn't super fast. Uh, that's just determined by the voltage I'm able to supply to the stepper motor through this little driver. So, you know, it's kind of as fast as it can go. Um, I've got a pretty high feed selected, so if we cut that down to nine tenths per second. So you can see it would be feeding in that direction, rapiding back. I'm super impressed by this little TMC2209 stepper driver. It is so smooth and quiet, you can barely notice it. It's really cool. Um, the last thing is just that the motor de-energizes as soon as you're not feeding. So it'll move a bit and then it's de-energized now so I can turn it by hand. And the encoder readout will still be correct. So that is not a proper digital readout. That's not a linear encoder. That's the encoder on the back of the motor, but it is pretty repeatable, even if it's not, um, it doesn't account for backlash. So all in all, it's a nice feature to have, but yeah, that's sort of how the system works. Um, as I'm sure I've mentioned in a different point in this video, I would like to have the control box in the headstock. That's got to also control the spindle speed for my machine. Um, it's also got to have the sensors from the spindle going into the TNC here. So that belongs in the headstock. Once I get this stupid noise figured out on these wires, this is going to be a totally separate unit and that'll live somewhere outside on the machine. The last piece I got from JLC PCB is the notch disc I'm going to use as a spindle encoder. It's cut from 6061 aluminum and flat black anodized. One of them cost about $20 all in, so I ordered two, just assuming I was going to accidentally destroy one. Perfect. Okay, so the deal with these things is you, well, ideally you would have a spec to tighten these two. I know for a fact that this is sitting up against a hard shoulder on the outside of the bearing pack. So me changing the tightness on this has zero impact on the preload of the bearings. So I'm sort of just going to, uh, I don't know, go until it's pretty darn tight. One of the things people really liked about this machine is to change the belt out. You could just take the back of the headstock off like I did. Do whatever you want to do with the belt. Oh my god, the belt. Okay, so I bumped that in a lot closer and it looks like it's running a lot truer now. I just used a dial indicator mounted inside the machine on a magnetic thing. And uh, yeah, I just indicated the tips and... Uh, anyways... Man, that worked great. So um, now I should be able to just mount the sensors. I'm going to turn the machine off and power it down just to be safe. But the plan is just to have a sort of a block thing that mounts in here, sticks out a bit, and uh, it's those optical interrupter things that'll read the, uh, the slots as they go by. Something I've learned about filming projects is to record the first time they work. It's all well and good to save the reveal until the very end of the series when you can show the project working flawlessly, but if you have to finish the project entirely before you have anything to show for it, uh, people are going to get disappointed. Even though this is the primary z-axis on this machine, the angle can still be adjusted, so technically it's a compound slide. If you have a powered compound slide, you can cut really nice tapers, which is what I'm doing here. Note that I'm going for surface finish here rather than material removal. I also want to add that I still don't have the RPM sensors installed in the headstock. Those won't be practical until I can get the control panel to Teensy communication figured out, since they will require the Teensy to be in the headstock. For now I can cut pointy sticks in the unsynchronized mode and still end up with a nice surface finish. I'll try 20 thou per second.
I mean, that's pretty good. Yeah, that's nice. That's not. So I guess that's it for the electronics in this project. The system isn't perfect and will need at least one more board revision, but I'm feeling pretty good about it. As I'd mentioned earlier, I think I'll do a short video on some of the most useful lessons I've learned in this project. I'd also like to do a video on the firmware once I get the more advanced functions working, but I'm not sure if I'm going to treat that as a necessary step in finishing the project. It's an interesting topic, but perhaps not critical to the story. Anyway, thanks for watching and don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, don't forget about those JLC PCB coupons in the video description. Cheers!